There we go. Yeah, thank you, Athena. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And we'll say goodbye to Athena and we'll make sure everyone who needs to come in is in and everything. And here we go. Okay. Seeing a presence of a quorum, I am calling this Community Resources Committee meeting of the town council to order at 4.31 p.m. on July 20th, 2023, pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by chapters 22 and 107 of the Acts of 2022 and further extended by chapter two of the Acts of 2023. This meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time. Also, this meeting is being recorded, both um, audio and uh, some of us are on video. Um, with that, I am going to take roll call um, to make sure committee members can hear and be heard. We're going to start with Shalini. Present. Uh, Pat. Present. Mandy is present. Pam. I'm here. And we are missing Jennifer Taub right now. If she arrives in, we will catch her and make sure and test that she can hear and be heard. Um, with that, we're going to go right into our meeting. Um, there are no public hearings. We have one action item. Well, it might be three, but I'm hoping we get to votes today. But residential rental bylaw is what we're going to start with right away. We're going to start with the bylaw, and then we will move to regulations, and then we will move to the permitting fee structure. As we go through, I, I will hope to save the votes for the end of the full discussion between them, um, just in case as we get to say regulations or fee, we have to pop back to bylaw because we're doing something between the two. So it would just be cleaner if we if we get through it all and are ready to vote that we do it all at the end instead of between each thing. Um, with that, I see that Jennifer has joined us. So Jennifer, can you hear us? Oh, I'm not, yes, I can hear you. Sorry. There we go. Oh, my... <laughs> now we're I am. Sorry. No, no problem. I'm just making sure everyone. Yeah. Um, okay, with that, I had asked last week that everyone come with their potential or their desired changes to um, the bylaw, um, well, to each of them that they read it so that we could potentially get to a vote today. Um, so we will start, as I said, with the bylaw itself. I am going to put on the screen um, the bylaw that is in the packet and I'm gonna give you uh, we're going to go through section by section, um, but I will say, as I was going through it, I saw some what I thought of were um, clerical errors or things that hadn't been cor corrected. They are marked changes in here. I thought it would speed us up if I just put them in. We will go over them so you can see them. I have some others myself that I'd like to that were not that, um, but um, and if anyone doesn't like the clerical changes I've made, let me know. Um, there aren't too many of them, but um, we're going to start with penalties and section A. Um, are there any requested changes, revisions, questions to penalties or section A? Pam. Yeah, in section A, um, item number three, it's one of our purposes that we started out with, and it was to encourage energy efficiency in the portion of housing stock that is rental property. It's still a very great goal. It's a wonderful purpose, but we completely eliminated it. And I think we should not be, I think we should not include it as a, as a purpose um, because we, we have left nothing in that requires any kind of accounting for um, construction of buildings, furnaces, nothing is left. Does everyone agree? with the deletion of that section based on what Pam stated. I don't, I don't like eliminating it, but I, but I have to be honest that we didn't address it, <laughs> sadly. I'm seeing a lot of nods, so we will go ahead and hit that deletion. Um, any- um, Sorry. Oh, Colony, yeah. Could, could it be an aspirational goal? Like even though we're not in this moment doing anything, but I don't know. 
thoughts on that, whether there's a rewording? I, you know what? Well, I really care about energy efficiency, et cetera, particularly for people who are renting. If yeah. it's not in here, this is a bylaw. It's not the aspiration. And I think that we should eliminate it unless we're gonna put back all that material, which we removed. Um, if we get to a place where we wanna amend the bylaw after it's passed, et cetera, because we're actually doing something or, or find something, that seems okay, I don't know. Thank you, Pat. Jennifer. Jennifer looks frozen. Oh, she's added herself again. I, I had to, I, it just froze. So I had to um, resign. So how do I get myself down? Oh, how do I get out of here? Oh, <laughs> I'm. Wait a second. Okay, no, let me you're, get. You're I'm fine. On Twitter. Just, I'm just gonna, make your comment because we can hear you now. Yeah, we can hear you and all. I muted your other self. Uh, wow. Okay, I'll try and get. <laughs> I can't get out of there. No, I'm sorry. I, I just have to apologize. I was going through on my own, you know, in preparation for the meeting. I was really going through the draft with the attorney comments. Hmm. So, no, that's fine. Yeah. But I agree in terms of the, I don't think we can be aspirational for better or worse in a bylaw. Is that correct? So, you know, bylaws are what we're going to do and enforce and right. create the law, right? The aspirations tend to be more in proclamations and resolutions yeah. and all, um, and bylaw purposes tend to state what the bylaw is going to do. Um, Shalini, how are you feeling? Yeah, okay, I'm okay for deleting it. And if I find there's anything that slightly alludes to <laughs> this purpose in a bylaw, then we can stick it back in. But for now, we can delete it. Sounds good. Okay. Anything else for purpose or penalties? See none, we're gonna move on to definitions. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh, Pam. Yeah. Good for definitions? Well, you're not good for definitions. We're moving on to definitions. <laughs> Let me be clear. You had two questions on definitions. I know from last week, um, but there might be more. Um, is that a residual hand, Jennifer? Yes. Okay, just wanted to make sure. Yep. Lodging facility, we'll start with the two that Pam brought up last week, lodging facilities. Um, things were brought up in and put in packets about lodging facilities. Pam, having read everything, what are your thoughts on lodging facilities? Uh, I don't think we should change our current bylaw um, zoning definition, Article 12. So was, you were apparently there was apparently an overriding override of the of the Worcester finding. And so they were not deemed lodging houses. So we, we should not use that. I do appreciate, I, I agree with you, Pam, but I appreciated you bringing that up and then seeing the SJC. Both both opinions were very interesting to read. I will say that um, yeah. in how the courts analyzed what is a lodging house versus what is a dwelling unit and tenants' rights and all. It was it was quite fascinating to me, actually. Um, so I appreciate you bringing that up for various thinkings. Um, owner occupants. So I thought there was enough interest that somebody might come up with um, a refined definition of an owner occupant. And at the moment, I don't actually have any wording um, unless you might, Mandy Jo, to to insert um, the the essence of of a trust named for the you know current owners, the current occupants. Yeah, I mean, I was looking at, let me go get my definition in Article 12, the zoning bylaw, but I was looking at our definition of owner is the legal owner, um, which can be the trust and all. And I think your concern was if the trust is listed as the legal owner, is a trustee an owner occupant, I think would be the best way to word that, right? Is sort yeah. of what your thinking was, right? Um, and certainly owner includes the trust here. Um, person is an individual or a trust. And owner occupant in our bylaw 
in the zoning bylaw is one or more natural persons who in their individual capacity as distinct from any representative capacity owns a whole or undivided interest in fee simple of certain real property and at least one of whom occupies a dwelling unit thereon as his principal re residence. So given the zoning bylaw article 12 definition, since it's a natural person, trusts would not count as owner occupants, probably, right? Um, if the owner occupant must be a natural person, but the owner can be a trust, they would not um, match in a sense. Um, we could potentially add on to the owner occupant here. I would hesitate to write our own new definition. I would like to, if we wanted to do something, include the definition in article 12 and then maybe add on an or something um, to, to do something specific. The only concern I have, and then we'll go to Jennifer, is um, can we get, can we find something that covers the situations you're talking about, Pam, but not the big corporate yeah. entities, or or what I worry about is trusts that then um, take so on the, the take owner on occupants the, yeah. say say the tenants are owners of the trust somehow, right, um, right, and, right. Yeah, that would be my only worry, Jennifer. Yeah, this I don't know if this is what you're getting at, um, Mandy, but. So, you know, what we're, I don't know if we can specify, you know, like we want to allow, if there's a older person who, well, this have to be older, but someone who's put their, the, this came to us from people that were older and it put it in like a Medicaid trust, I think is how they put it. And they wanted, but they are the owner and they rent out units in their, in their property. So there have been situations where a parent will buy a house, their child will live in it and be considered an owner occupant. And that has sometimes, those are sometimes nuisance properties. Um, if they create a trust and their child who could be, you know, is, is one of on the trust, then, then they would be an owner occupant. I mean, is there a way to distinguish or sometimes they'll just say they're an owner occupant and they haven't actually put them on the deed. Um, and then they're technically, they're not, but mm -hmm. how do we, and I know that um, John Thompson and Rob have said this is problematic, that this has been a way that people have sort of gotten around some of the owner occupancy issues. Yeah, Pat. Yeah, no, I was gonna ask Jennifer for some quick uh, factual backup, but she just provided it by talking about John and Rob. Uh, the house on the corner here was purchased by uh, parents of a graduate a woman, young woman, graduate student in the five-year engineering program. She went through that. There were other roommates in the program. She moved, went to Princeton, uh, and they kept renting it to young women in the program. And it it's never been a problem. I, so the, this is, it's I just want us to make sure that we're not creating definitions uh, to s because we don't like something that somebody does. Uh, we don't like that parents buy a house for their kid. Because after uh, Kanani left and went on to Princeton University, she no longer lived there. So, but the house was still rented to students. So I, I, I just, right, which happens all the time. Then it's just an owner. Then it's a yeah, but is it necessarily a problem? And I don't, I don't know if it necessarily is. And I'm, I get, I'm just kind of feeling like, come on. You know? So, well, sometimes so, it's they have more people living in the house, and they try and get around it. They claim it's owner occupied. You know, there are all That's kinds it. of yeah. things that people do in their individual houses that are appropriate and inappropriate, but in terms of our bylaws, but I, there's just what? this very no, narrow fear, this fear, is, fear, 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 no, that's okay. driving me crazy. It's not, it's not fear, Jennifer. That, but this, yeah, this is something that has been a concern Pat. of the building department for a long yes. time. Yeah. But Pat and Jennifer, let's, let's, yep. Sorry. let's, let's keep it to this definition and yep. uh, maybe something I'm going to say will help. So I just did a search for the use of owner occupant in our bylaw. 
Um, and it's literally used only in this definition, which means in some sense we could get rid of this definition if it shows up nowhere else in the bylaw. I have not searched the regulations yet, but if it's nowhere else in the bylaw, we're not distinguishing in the bylaw a difference between owner occupant and non owner occupant, except um, if we search for owner, we'll get more. Um, there are parts of the bylaw where the owner's dwelling unit is not inspected. Um, right, and things like that, but we don't use the term owner occupant. So the only place, you know, in the fee schedule, we're not using the term owner occupant, but we're talking about owner occupied dwellings and all. If we don't define it in the bylaw, it might allow, if we delete this because it's technically not used at all, we, we have owner defined. And so when we use owner later on, um, you go back to the word owner and all. If this is no not if this definition isn't used, we could delete it here and potentially allow during the fee schedule and all the building commissioner to make the determination as to what and who is an owner occupant. Um, instead of wrestling with the decision here, since it would appear from my search of using owner occupant that this particular definition does not need to be in this bylaw. Um, I can do a search over here for owner, and then I can do a regulation search to see if we use it in the reg regs, um, if people would like to see where owner is used. But um, so my thoughts to potentially given seeing this, just delete the whole thing. Uh, Pam. Um, I, yeah, I appreciate that explanation. Um, you're, you're just to confirm, I heard what you said. You're saying that we don't actually use the the owners owner hyphen occupant in the, anywhere in this bylaw so in this navigation pane that you should be able to see you can see the the word owner occupant shows up exactly four times one two three four you can actually see all four times right on this page just in this definition oh, it's one definition yeah. Just in that definition, it appears nowhere else in the bylaw. And so in that case, normally well, that's three, not four. The fourth is the comment. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, sorry, it's very the small. The yeah, the comment's very small. The fourth is the comment. So um yeah, so we might be able to get around this by just deleting it since it has not we did not separate owner occupancy from non-owner occupancy generally in the bylaw at all. If we go to owner, that one will have a lot more. That that has a lot more, right? Um, it talks about person in charge. It shows up um, who the permit is issued to. Um, we can look at it further on, but if we're not using owner occupant, um, we might not need the term. We so use we, owner, owner occupied three times, it looks like, in occasional rentals. And so owner occupied, even though we haven't defined it, we've capitalized it. There is owner occupant here. Yep. But is it in the fee schedule? We do talk about it. Is, we, we talk about owner occupied in the fee schedule. I have no idea why this one didn't pop up. I, I was going to say we definitely have it in the fee schedule. Yeah. But if it's in the in the yeah. draft bylaw. So these are the three sections where we talk about owner occupied. It's all in um, inspections and whether an inspection is required. Those are important issues, and I think therefore we should have owner occupant in it or owner occupied defined. You know, yeah. and the reason I froze is I was looking to see if, if John, if Rob or John were here so they could address what I said before, because they're yeah. better to address it than me, Pat. Right. No, I, I you yeah. use them and I, that's right. a no, good that's reference. You don't have to before. prove the reference from them. Yeah. Thanks, Jen. So if this is the only time along with potentially the fee schedule, which we can deal with the fee schedule separately, um, that this comes up, there's a potential to add what 
owner occupied means. But again, we have to be careful because, you know, I, I appreciate Pat's concerns of how do you delineate one trust from another, right? And all. And so it might, and then you're treating different trusts differently based on what, and that could be viewed as discrimination. So I would be hesitant to do something like that, but I'd like to hear others. Jennifer? No, I agree. That's why I wanted to ask the building department because I, yeah. I, I, you know, I know we can't say, well, trusts are okay unless it's this trust. But um, the other thing I wanted to ask, and maybe it's more in the fee schedule, but if, um, if, if an owner goes on sabbatical for a year, then that year is, do we, would define it as not owner occupied? No. So that that year would fall under this. They would need at this point. It was something you wanted to talk about up above when we when we get through definitions. Um, it would under here. They would have to have a permit, but they would not need an inspection. Right. But okay. Right. But in, okay. But it, we can get to the fee schedule whether they're still paying the fee as an owner occupant. Right, I think they would be considered an owner occupant because of this occasional rental exception. But I don't know, that would be a Rob thing and Rob's not here, um, but they might not because of how owner occupant is defined residing in at the time of rental. So they wouldn't be residing in at the time of rental. They just wouldn't need an inspection maybe. It could be interpreted either way. So what are we gonna do with owner occupant in the definition? Pam? Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna lean toward keeping article twelve, keeping the definition in article twelve as it is, and acknowledging that we're aware of situations where um, you know people have have moved to um, put the property in the name of a trust I was thinking of some fancy way of saying well maybe you know if they still live there and the the name of the trust reflected themselves but again that just it it's so easy to create a different kind of trust that would be probably not what we're intending here. So I would say we we leave that interpretation of Article 12 up to the up to the building commissioner. Melanie? So wouldn't if the trustee was li living in the house, then wouldn't that be considered what what would be the confusion if the trustee is living in the in the house, why would that not be considered owner occupied? So it would be up to the building commissioner because the definition in Article 12 says one or more natural persons who, in their individual capacity, as distinct from any representative capacity, own a whole or undivided interest in fee simple, blah, blah, blah. So as a trust, you're a representative if you're a trustee, not if the trust owner. owns it, right? Because the trust owns it. And so it's not a natural person owning it in their own capacity, in their individual capacity, not a representative capacity. Hmm. But we want to give a break to people who are, for whatever reasons in their family arrangements, they have that and it's owner occupied. It's just, it's a technical term. Right, but we also run into the situation where if we do that, well, Jennifer pointed out one where non-trusts are considered owner occupants if there are parents buying it and um, an 18 or 19 year old lives in it without the parents that could be considered owner occupied. But I also brought up the situation where a conglomerate trust might own it, but see this depending on the fee break, right? And make the tenants, no matter who the tenants are, maybe when I was a tenant, they'd, they'd say, I'm a trustee of the trust for that year. Um, and then suddenly I'm an owner occupant too. And so there's there's multiple ways that can be. Is that a thing though? Like, is, is, that, is it that easy to just put replace trustees year after year? Or are we just speculating? 
So I'm speculating, but trustee replacements generally not that hard. Depends on how the trust is written. Yeah. I would put a question. I'm going to put a question. I mean, this actually came up because we want to make it possible for older people that have set up those trusts. We want them to be owner occupants. Exactly. Right. But it seems that there are there are just too, too many loopholes that um, that could be taken advantage of if someone were less than scrupulous. But do we know that? We don't know that if that's even a thing. We're speculating that that could be a thing, but we don't know of any such case. What we do know is that there are older people and families that have trust, and we want them to live in their you know, in those homes. And we would be then, and if they rent it out, like if they want additional people or something, then we are making it harder for them. No, the whole reason Pam brought, we brought it up last time is to make it easier for the people that yeah. have medical trusts. But I know that, you know, we were just saying, would, does that impact if somebody, which it, would, it is a thing, you know, I, I mean, I would want the air on the side of the older people being able to have their trust, but it is actual a thing where if there's any way people can be fin can become financially advantaged by doing something, they will. And then that yeah. does happen. It does, it, Pat, it happens in, it does happen. <laughs> Not everybody's, you know. Pam. You don't then, know what I'm wincing about. Yeah. <laughs> don't make assumptions. I don't, I don't, you're right, you're right. I, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, um, I'm going to say that I think the interpretation of owner occupant, I think we all have a common understanding of what owner occupant means. And even if to the nth degree of the law, it may not be a fact that, you know, Mr. and Mrs. X who have put their house in a trust are, are not, you know, technically by law, the owner occupants anymore. Um, I think, I think interpretation of this by our by our town staff or by anyone reviewing, you know, this would understand exactly what we mean by owner occupant. And I and I think rather than craft some torturous <laughs> route around this thing, um, I'm I'm feeling that maybe we just leave it alone and we don't touch Article 12. Well, we couldn't touch Article 12 without yeah. hearings and everything. We'd have to just craft a new definition or add on to this definition um, and not have it agree. But I agree with Pam. I would leave it as is um, and see how this works. Um, bylaws can always be amended. We can always, you know, depending on what Rob thinks and all after it's in place or even potentially before it, you know, like it, you can, you can relook at it to, if it's not working as we wanted it to. That would be my thoughts. Um, Jennifer. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think we all want to um, do what we can to encourage owner occupancy. I mean, that's been something the town has had that sort of value for a long time. So I would feel comfortable that building and safety would always want to accommodate that. Okay. So I will point out that I added a period at the end of this definition that was missing. Um, it's what's in Thank red. You. So um, I said I'd point out the changes I made as, as we went along. Any other discussion of any definitions, section B, before we move on to section C? Pam. Can of Worms, we had originally a, a student home definition and somewhere in this long process, it has been removed from the definitions. I don't believe we refer to it anywhere else in the text um, or in the regulations, but I but I would love to double check that if we could if we could check regs and bylaw on student home, um, I would appreciate that. So student does not show up in the bylaw. I know it shows up in the regulations um, in the application section. I won't flip to that now. In the application, we ask, um, I'm not gonna share my screen for that. Um, in the regs, the application, there is a item 
uh, G, one, A1G, the number of dwelling units on the property that are occupied by one or more persons where during the leasing period at least one occupant will attend an educational institution as defined by the residential rental property bylaw, including properties where the owner or owner's family members are occupants of the dwelling unit. Um, so that's the only place that I saw in the regs that that, yeah. that comes up. Um, in previous discussions, I think given we got rid of point systems and we got rid of different types of permits and everything, um, it was thought that we can start this way by trying to ask that question so that we can start tracking yeah. how many. Yeah, thank you. But, I think but that's... there were no other de delineations beyond that. Yeah, thank you. We ready to move on to section C? Section C, any changes to C, and then we'll move on to D. D seems basic, so. See none. Uh, section D, residential rental permit required. Pam. Pam. Uh, D1, uh, except as da da da, in the second on the, the next page in my in my version here. Um, I'll read it. Let's see. Um, except as provided in section the E below, it shall be unlawful to operate or rent to individuals or households, property or dwelling units um, being operated. Yeah, oh, in a lodging or boarding house being operated as a principal zoning use. Okay. Um, I actually I didn't see the word lodging or boarding house. It could, and I was trying to figure out if it if it applied to accessory dwelling units because those are accessory units. So I I missed the word lodging or boarding house. Sorry. Yeah. So so you bring up a good point. I missed that in my read. Because exemptions below, we exempt lodging facilities from this. Right. So why are we talking? So about... why are we calling rooming units and lodging and boarding houses in here at all if we exempt lodging facilities? Um, and ADUs. So the any rooming unit in a lodging was the principal zoning use for a lodging house. Okay, so that's legit. But then we exempt lodging facilities below. I would be hesitant without Rob here to actually get rid of that sentence completely. But ADUs, um, owner of residential rental property to operate um, or rent residential rental property or a dwelling unit. Um, so as I think as ADUs are covered. As a principal zoning use and an ADU is not a principal zoning use. But um, let's go back up to residential rental property. Any building or portion thereof which is offered to rent or lease as a living facility, regardless of whether anyone is currently dwell residing in it, a rooming unit is a group of rooms to let. Um, property is all lands and property of any nature. So if you have if you have an ADU which is detached, it's not part of it's not part of the um, portion thereof, any building or portion thereof, it would be separate. So I guess the question is, is this principal zoning use modifying just the lodging or boarding house or is it modifying at all? Um, it's probably it's po probably modifying any rooming unit.
So I think if it's if it's modifying a rooming unit in a lodging or boarding house, then ADUs would not be exempted from this because they're not lodging or boarding houses, I don't believe. Right. They would be a dwelling unit and that qualifies. Yeah. So I think we're good. It was a good good catch to ask. We could mark it as a question, and even if we vote, we could leave it as a check with Rob if you want. Um, Shalini. It's a clarifying question. Did I remember us discussing that we would give the rental, uh, we would allow people to rent if even if they don't have the registration yet? But they are like in process. So where is that reflected? It's That's not in F application. We'll get down there. Okay. 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 Are we going to leave this the same? Are we going to make a note to ask Rob? Can we make a note? And it would be, it's really, it's really, if principal zoning use is the, is the intent or if it's principal zoning use of, of a lodging or boarding house. Okay, note made. Anything else in section D? If not, we'll move on to exemptions. The note, oh, Pam. If you wanna talk about the note, go ahead and do that first. Oh, I was just gonna say the note from last week, Pam said we, well, no, I think this was Jennifer wanted to check on sabbatical permit requirements. And so I looked through the bylaw and Yes, from my reading, they would be required to have a permit because they are renting under section D, but we have exempted the them from an inspection requirement. They're fully exempted from the inspection for the first year. If the sabbatical or something extends for a second year, they would then need to comply with the inspection. Okay, thank you. Pam. So um, item three is dormitories owned and operated by an educational institution. And that now includes um, the pu public private partnership, the P3 Fieldstone buildings that are not operated by the university. They are owned. I think they, I think they cleverly made them owned by the university, but they are definitely not operated by the university. And I would like very much to have those come under the purview of this bylaw. And I'll be very honest, as a step one to making, um, I'd like to see them taxed and taxable. And and we we if we if we don't include them in our in our purview now, it will be harder to come back later and and ask for them to be added to the tax base. So as you stated, they are not operated by the educational institution, and so they are not exempt from this bylaw. They would have to comply with it, right? That's, that's we. I know we've talked about this a lot with Rob. He wanted them included in this bylaw, and at least as long as the situation remains how they are now, they would have to comply with the bylaw. Good. F, application. Um, we'll start with section one, the, the section of application you can see on this page because it's the easiest thing to start with. And then we'll page down and I can address Shalini's question from there. Any requests for changes? I will page down. Um, oh wait, the application is not where it is. It's in G, sorry Shalini, it's an issuance or denial. 
Um, there is C and D for the application. Um, See nothing, we'll move on to issuance or denial. I'm gonna page up. Um, you can see Shalini, that conditional permit. Um, oh, in section G1, I added an S to permit here um, because the wording, the principal code official may issue separate permit for each dwelling unit. Um, so I said it should say permits. Um, and then you'll see down here in four, this was this is what Shalini was asking and also um, something we changed last week in response to the town attorney's concerns about um, actually it might not have been the attorney's concerns. I, I can't remember. I think there was something in the regulations or something about ensuring that the inspection happens before um, a permit is issued. Uh, we added that if an inspection is scheduled but has not taken place yet, um, then the town can issue a conditional permit until the inspection takes place, um, thinking someone might not think well in advance that they need to apply for this, and so they might apply for it two days before someone moves in and not have time to schedule that inspection. So if it's scheduled, the permit can issue, they would remain not, they would remain in compliance as long as all the other parts of the application are complete other than the inspection um, so that they would not be fined and all until, and then they'd be operating under this conditional permit there. You'll see a couple of additions of inspector reinspect because it used to just be the reinspection if the inspection failed. And so I, in reading it over again, I felt like it needed the words inspect in there because it wasn't a reinspection always that the conditional permit was operating under. Um, so that's why those show up there to recognize that it's not just reinspections now that might cause a conditional permit to issue. Um, any other in section G and Shalini? So do you think it's clear enough for people when they read um, the section above, where is that, the D, where it says that you can't rent until the applicable re residential rental permit has been issued, that's what it says in D, and then it's later on in G that they find out that, well, if you've applied and done all these things, then because it, they haven't been issued the thing. So it's kind of a little. They will have to have been issued the conditional permit. So, and, and but in above it says until the applic applicable residential rental permit has been issued. So should we say until applicable residential rental slash conditional permit? Or does conditional fall under that? Or does it fall Definition. under? Because it, when I read it, I'm like, oh, but what if I filed, but it's not approved? And so it leaves it a little ambiguous for someone applying. So residential rental permit is defined as a permit issued to an owner pursuant to the provisions of this bylaw. So I would argue that a conditional permit would count as a residential rental permit. Because it would be it, it would be a permit issued so then maybe for people who are not that legal like me maybe within brackets but we could say including conditional so they don't freak out you're thinking up here yeah in the d section where it says until yeah over there within brackets including conditional because i would not have made that connection until i read and hopefully read all through to, and reached F, but I might have just like, oh no, I can't get it. You know, I may have just stopped over there. Thank you. Is that okay with everyone? I think it should say include, including A, because 
conditional permit. Yep, um, I just made that change. Yeah, thanks. Okay. G, any, oh, I have, Shalini, is that all? Okay, I have two potentials. Bear with me as I toggle between things. In section G2, number F, this residential rental property has passed an inspection within the applicable time frame in accordance with section I and the applicable regulations. I was actually wondering if it was necessary in light of section B, which is all requirements for a residential rental permit in section I of this bylaw have been met. Section I includes the inspection. Mm. Um, and section I includes inspection required. Um, residential rental property shall have passed an inspection by the town of its that. And so I was just, I, it struck me, it, it seemed duplicative. I'm not gonna like live or die on whether we keep it, but um, uh, in thinking about duplication, I thought F was covered under B and that F could probably be deleted. I think it can be deleted. I, the more we can slim this down, but keep its intent and purpose, uh, I think the better. Jennifer and Pam and Shalini, would that be okay? Do you see any problems with that? Is the town attorney looking at it anymore? Um, we can always ask for the town attorney. I, mean, I don't know if it's worth that. it, but I mean, if he, it seems yeah. okay. We, we can always ask for the town attorney to throw one more look at it. I assume this will go to GOL, even though we recommend passage since it doesn't automatically go there right now. Um, part, yeah. part of what's going through my head is that under G issuance or denial, um, it's, it's sort of a summary of, I mean, I, I think we have some redundancy in, in some of the coverage anyway. Um, but we talk about um, essentially um, the code official may issue a permit if if we've satisfied you know A B C D and E and F, and so it it just reminds them of fees of of um, all the requirements in a list. The applicable it meets all the the applicable applicable codes or bylaws. And it includes a, an inspection. So I, I'm not sure that it's it's a little redundant. But then you you move on to um, you know H, which is all the fees that need to be paid. So you you address fees in that list as well. You know fees have been paid. Inspection has been has been passed. Um, it seems like I. One I one A is just more of a definition of of the inspection required. So I'm not sure that it it doesn't jump out at me as being inappropriate. What if we in section B said all requirements, including passing an inspection within the applicable time frame? comma for well all requirements for residential permit in section i of this bylaw comma and then including passing an inspection within the applicable time frame have been met in section b so just move some of it up to to bring forth the uh, another I'm, I'm reminder of inspection is required but not repeat sort of the section, the reference to section I twice. I think it just struck me as we referenced section I twice. Would that work, Pam? Um, I I have to admit that I did not follow. I could not figure out what section B you were talking about, so I was get losing track. Oh, right here where I'm typing now. I mean the, the one that I can hardly read. Yeah, I'm, I'll I'll do it. <laughs> So I think this B, well, I think F is redundant in light of B. 
that you can't delete B because B includes all of section right. I, but F is one part of section I. And so I read it as redundant to section B, but I can hear how reinforcing that an inspection is required up in this issuance or denial could be important. And so we might not want to lose some of that language. So I guess my proposal is to include what's in red and how now highlighted in section B to be able to delete this. It, you know, if, <laughs> if we wanted to be really slim, we would have the item number two, the principal code official may issue a residential rental permit to the applicant within 30 days upon proof that all of the requirements for a residential rental permit in section one of this bylaw, including passing an inspection in the applicable time frame, have been met, period, and we could get rid of mm. A, C, C. This is an I. This is I, which applies only to additional requirements. Application is section like C right now, I think, or D. So some of these are in different sections, not in section I. Um, but we could, we could just say all of the requirements of this bylaw period. But I like the idea of setting forth some of the different ones so that people know where to look and what, what there are, but I'm just trying to reduce some redundancy. Does this work? Yeah, fine. Um, my other question in section G was section G6. Um, the transfer of permit. Oh, um, the reference here, it references, oh, I think we need to reference a payment of a fee in the transfer of permit section. Um, and I was wondering if we should have may instead of shall. Um, and you'll see, I, I'll, I'll explain these reds too, but right now it requires the transfer, the, it requires the permit to be transferred um, but up above in issuance of denial, Rob actually wanted to say May, and we do say May issue. And so I was thinking we probably want this to be May trans tra be transferable upon change of owners, not shall. I think that's an important yeah. change. I agree. And then, you know, we referenced in here, um, provided that the permitted use has not changed and inspection is completed pursuant to section I below, and the operation of the continued rental use shall be subject to the provisions, which sounded weird to me. So I said the operation of the continued rental use complies with the provisions of the permit and management plan. Sounded better. And I would add before that, Um, because we actually have a fee for transfer. We have a potential fee for transferring the permit. Um, and we didn't reference it in here. And I think it's wise to reference that fee and make sure that's been paid before the permit is transferred. Does that work for people? Yep. Yeah. There's an Red one here, we had somehow lost the word the, um, and we had also lost the in 15 feet. So it had read notify the town of change of ownership with 15 calendar days. And so I added the within 15 calendar days. <laughs> um, um, yeah, any other changes to, what is this? This is issuance or denial. Any other requested changes before we move on to section H fees? Section H fees, any requested changes? No. I'm not hearing any, we'll move on to I, requirements to obtain a permit. This one's a long one. Um, so we'll go with what's on the screen each time. If there's no changes, I'll move on. I will scroll down. If someone finds something as we move on, we can always go back. I had a question in, oh, section C, we're not quite there yet. Actually, we kind of are. So section C says they may seek a search warrant from a court of competent jurisdiction 
down below in section uh, five, um, down here, no. I think I've got the wrong section. Um, we reference an administrative warrant, not a search warrant. Is that in section L under consent? It's probably under section L. I had it listed as I would. Yeah, this, this court relief um, apply for an administrative warrant from the appropriate official which is also interesting because we use here um, search warrant from a court of competent jurisdiction. Um, I don't know whether we need to go to Rob for the correct language in both. Um, sorry, Mandy, I'm sorry. Are you asking, should we call it an administrative warrant or should we call it a search warrant? Th th that's what I'm asking. I think the word should the phrase should agree, and I just don't know which one it is. So we I should probably like, ask. I mean, administrative sounds much less ominous than a search warrant. Yeah. I feel like administrative is the right word. Yeah. Yeah. Right, because we're not searching their personal possessions. Right. Not okay. yet. Hopefully. I feel like the administration, the administrative is the right word. Those were all the changes I had in section I. Anyone else have any changes? Oh, uh, the here under was changed. I changed to here in and I added a comma. Um, here under, it, it's more of a legal thing that here under would be everything below and here in is everything within the bylaw, not just below. And so we want all property regulated within the bylaw, not below section I3. The technical thing. Uh, you have the same thing under number four with regulations adopted here under and in number five also here under. So they all need to get changed. So yeah, so the regula regulations are not adopted within the bylaw. They're adopted under the bylaw or pers adopted pursuant to this bylaw. We can change that one to pursuant to the bylaw. The question, the question is, if if we're considering here in instead of here under, under in number three, why would the same situation not apply to number four and number five? So number three references the by the the here under is referencing the bylaw itself. Numbers four and five are referencing the regulations adopted pursuant to the bylaw. So I'm changing it. If you look up at the screen from here under to pursuant to this bylaw, which is how we actually generally reference the regulations adoption. Um, I think up here, um, regulations adopted under this bylaw before permit. So regulations adopted under this bylaw to keep the language consistent. Does that work for people? Yeah. Okay. Anything else for section I? We're gonna to move to section J. There's our consistency regulations under this bylaw. <laughs> section K, what's on the screen at least? So sections one A and B. And I'll move down to the rest of K. It includes the tenant information sheet, leases available and course of conduct. See no changes. Uh, L, see if I can get, I can get, there's all of L. Any requested changes? I have a few. 
actually I have two. Section L3, the tenant authorization. Mm -hmm. um, I When I read it and then I read section L, so L2 says you have to, the owner has to give notice, good faith effort to arrange access, um, In a, um, for the purpose with notice to tenants, right? Because um, you have to arrange access through the tenants. And then three says you have to obtain consent from the tenants. Um, and I wondered if they conflicted. I know we talked about, if I make this smaller, Jonathan, um, our KP law attorney said we might not need to include three, four or five at all. But in reading two and three, I guess it's not necessarily a conflict, but sort of. Two says you just have to arrange a good faith effort to arrange access, which would include notice, right? And mm -hmm. three requires authorization. To me, they're slightly different. And I didn't know what people thought of the two. We had left these highlighted because we weren't sure whether we wanted to leave three, four, and five in to begin with after last week. So... Jennifer. It's a question. So one is saying the owner will notify the tenant and arrange a mutually convenient time for the inspection. And the other is saying that is just that the tenant has to explicitly give permission. Yeah. And it's, I guess it's implied if the tenant agrees to a time they can come. Right. And I think Jonathan said, if you read the legal comment to the side that all of that's state law regulated. Um, well, let me get you the whole legal comment here. Um, that they would cite to state codes and all, um, which all have provisions for inspections, said we could keep the language. He was always referring to an emergency, which I wasn't sure how that applied to section three, but it's just a question. I. Don't. I don't know what people think. I'm okay leaving it in. I just had a big I question. Just got a little bit of a. It's the a person in charge. The owner that their, their consent has to be, come from the tenants. If you're a landlord that is uh, uh, bullying your tenants, you won't get their consent. So it it seems to me that we. I don't know, I don't think that happens very often, but um, if what someone feels of a renter because their rent is affordable or whatever else, not in an affordable dwelling unit, uh, not an official, can they be kept from giving consent because they're afraid that uh, they'll be retaliated against? Yeah. And I, I just don't know, I don't know. Yeah. I'm happy to leave it in. Um, I think it's something that's in the current bylaw. Mm. It just struck me as strange right next to the other one, but. Um, and then my other question, I think dealt with the court relief. Um, Oh, is it redundant in light of I1C is what I was, is this court relief um, a known violation impeding the health and the tenant objects to the inspection? You can apply for, so I guess it's not redundant. Never mind. I withdraw that concern because the other one was talking about the renewal and, you know, the initial inspections, not a complaint inspection. And this one is something right. else. So never mind. Um, so I withdraw that one. The current bylaw I'm looking for the section.
Maybe it's not in the current bylaw since there aren't really inspections in the bylaw. We can move on to the next section. Okay, so the only the current bylaw has access to properties and it really only includes section two of what we were referencing. Mm -hmm. Which is notice to tenants. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, it basically includes this language only, the current bylaw. And we added this? So we must have added this from, yeah. from other um, bylaws we've seen. I think it seems to me that, that items one and two pretty much cover the base. And I think that's, especially if that's in our current bylaw, it, it seems to terribly compl complicate it to add the additional if we're over overreaching or over emphasizing what's already expected by notice to tenants. Yeah, unless our building department requested it, which I don't doesn't sound like they I don't think, did. I don't think they did. <clears throat> and then the notice of additional inspections were we attempt to give the owner reasonable notification and then the court relief i think it's okay to leave those in m this is our viol this is our last section even if it's three pages long <laughs> <laughs> any question we had oh no that's that's inclusion in a report that's my note for inclusion in a report i had one thing um and i'll page down to it section four is it four um, M four F? Oh, um, and, and I'll go through why those all change to appeal, and you can tell me to not do that if you want. So M four F down here, um, I gotta find it. This last sentence, as part of a consent agreement, the Board of License Commissioners is authorized to require that additional penalties, financial or point based be included in the agreement for failure to comply with the terms of the agreement. I would delete the phrase financial or point-based because we don't really have a point system anymore. Um, and I just don't think we can just say additional penalties be included in the agreement. So that it reads like that. So, I changed any time it referenced an administrative inquiry to administrative appeal under this section of appeals because it's called appeals, not inquiries. So it made sense to me. If people still like the word inquiry, we can figure it out, but it seemed to be more consistent if we referenced appeal instead of inquiry. Any other changes to section M? Felony. Clarification, when we say criminal penalties on top and then we never ever talk about that anywhere, what does that mean? So that is, um, that's this monetary penalty. They can be either criminal or civil. Uh -huh. So we do reference it, um, imposed as listed above. So they can be imposed on a criminal level or on a civil level. What is the difference between criminal enforcement and non-criminal? So criminal enforcement is a criminal citation that can only be written by a police officer. Non-criminal non can be written by whoever we've designated. Mm -hmm. um, beyond that, I 
I don't know how municipal criminal citations work in terms of the court system and all. Um, so I can't answer it beyond that. So a monitoring may be imposed upon them. Yeah, but here also I'm not seeing what the difference between a criminal versus like what makes it a criminal versus non-criminal penalty? A choice of the inf of essentially, I think if if Rob wanted to enforce it criminally, he would need to be bring police officers in to to write the ticket. Um, what would lead to him wanting to involve the police? Like what entails a criminal? I I can't answer that. Rob would have to answer that. So, do you think we should be clarifying what that is? We don't in any other bylaw. Okay. When we give the option of one or the other, Jennifer? It would be something like if you found something illegal in the, I don't know. And so, so I would guess, you know, I don't know whether Rob's ever written criminal site, well, whether Rob's had anyone write a criminal citation versus a civil under our current one, right? Um, but you could imagine that if the police are called and find, well, here, I'll, I'll, we had the, I don't know, was it Phillips Street where the balcony fell and collapsed mm -hmm. <laughs> during a party, right? I don't know whether they were violating the rental registration bylaw, but if they were, um, you could imagine in a case like that, that they would decide to write it as a criminal citation and not a civil citation. But I don't know. I think it's worthy of uh, defining what that is, like, it just says they could be a criminal, but then I don't know when would it be considered a criminal. We've never defined and differentiated in terms of description as to in the bylaw telling the enforcement person when they should choose criminal versus civil. We've always left it up to their um uh -huh. They're... Okay, as long as, I mean, I guess as long as all the violations are listed and then it's up to the staff to decide amongst themselves, that's fine. Yep. Okay. Yep. Anything else in this one? Seeing none, we are going to move on to the regulations. Mm -hmm. Come on. <clears throat> Section A, application requirements. I, I, I can't get it all on here. I added a comma, an Oxford comma. <laughs> um, You're not leaving anything for GOL to do. I'm trying not to, Pat, make GOL's <laughs> life easy. <laughs> So I'm sorry you you've now you've now transitioned to re re regulation. Yes. Um, so any any requested changes in section A of the regulations? Oh, I had one. A H two and three. We discussed these last week in terms in light of the um, attorney's opinion about whether we should whether this would be enforceable or not but i had a question in reading it again we have the shall in there i know we don't normally use the word should but would this one be better in light of the opinion of leaving it in there but saying should my guess is john would say i want to keep it a shall <laughs> but where, I, where are you option i'm in this one about responding oh. to within oh, an okay. hour or three hours and same with the email address the 48 hours there where we say shall um a response shall be responded to um within 48 hours and here a response I, I think that's a good compromise i don't know if it's a compromise but i mean it you know, it leaves the expectation that. in there. Yep, right. But you're not, yeah. Other thoughts? As in, as, as in there's no, we have absolutely no authority to, you know, deny a permit because somebody called back within an hour and a half. 
I mean, that's obviously just not going to be enforced. Right. I think so should true. makes more sense. You know, I, I think given that our attorney indicated that he would probably delete these and we wanted to leave it in because the expectation needs to be there, should seems to, as you say, Jennifer, might be a logical compromise there. Yeah. And if John doesn't like it or Rob doesn't like it after the council passes the should, the bylaw, the Board of License Commissioners can change it back to shall. I always think of shall may, but it's nice to know should is another option. Yes, yeah, should is sort of an expectation. Yeah. Yeah, it's not really a, I mean, may be responded to isn't quite the right word, right? right. Yeah, no, it's a new option. But should is not a requirement either, but it's a, yeah. I think it's stronger than, it's a different, I, I don't know, I see them differently, yeah. but that was my thoughts no, no, on no, I think that's good. Anything else with applications? If not, we'll move on to frequency. Oh, sorry, inspection requirements, section B. Again, I can't get it all on the page. Um, we did a lot of work with this last week because of all of, Jennifer, if you're looking at it, because of all of the attorney's comments on this. Yes. I had one in section one C. Oh, um, this, sick. <laughs> this one, one C two residential rental properly designated a problem property or nuisance property under the general bylaw. This is our nuisance bylaw that we haven't changed. So there's no designations under either of these, I don't right. think right now. So my suggested wording change, I'll put it on the screen um, so that people can see it. I'm not suggesting deleting it. That's good. I, I suggest changing it to residential rental property found in violation of general bylaw 3.26, we need the title of it, um, shall be, but well, may be, I think it says may, may yeah. be subject to inspections on a frequently ske frequency schedule. So we just need to come up with the definition of it, which I think I can find from our nuisance house bylaw. Because that's the current name of it. So I think that fixes that sort of, we're not doing them together, but keeps it in there. Does that work for everyone? So if we leave a nuisance house bylaw in this number two, um, I, I don't think anyone wants to have to come back and, and modify this bylaw again to update it. So, so this is the regulation. So the board could just make that update immediately or we can leave out the title um it's generally good to put the title in in case for some reason the number changes right you know exactly which one they were referring to we can make a note to tell the board of license commissioners or keep that in mind to send that over or we can delete the title i'm not wedded to it do you need it bigger that would be a bit bigger. Um, I don't mind. I don't mind, mind having it like this. And you're right. If they come back in the regulations and change it to the correct name, that's fine. Okay. Any other changes for, I don't know what big section we're on, the inspection section. It's one of our bigger sections. Section B. Uh, we'll move on to Section C, the plans, property management plan. Hold on, hold on, sorry. Oh, sure, sorry, Pam. Uh, under inspection requirements. We yep. went back and forth on number two about the number of units inspected. 
Yes. And, and I think, um, I thought we had changed it to 25% or something like that for B. So we have A is properties with less than 25 units. You inspect them all. For those with more than 25 units, um, okay, the, the code enforcement official shall have the discretion to select and inspect the sampling. Okay, we did not, we did yeah. not clarify the percent. We took we that changed out. We took the percentage out on the recommendation of the town attorney who mentioned up here under annual that we said that if you had more than 25 dwelling units, you have to be on a schedule that is necessary, deemed necessary to inspect every dwelling unit at least every five years. And he thought the other one was in conflict. So we changed the wording there to yeah. make good. it an agreement. That's why the percentages are gone. Yeah, I'm good. Thank you. Um. Let's move on to property management plans. Anything? Parking site plan. Tenant information sheet. If I'm moving too fast and you find something send me back. Appeals. I had one for appeals um, and it's this time requirements. It's not the one that's highlighted. Sections A and B are actually set forth in the bylaw. Our bylaw under appeals says that the application must be 14 days and the hearing must be 30 days from filing. I would delete it from the regulations then so that we don't risk any conflict between the bylaw and the regulation since the bylaw would always done. Yeah. I would just delete these two. And and where did we and where did we include that in the bylaw itself? In the bylaw, um it's uh, under uh, appeals, presumably. It is, yeah, it yeah. is under it appeals. Yep, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's yeah. under four A. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and I would retitle this time requirement to decision time requirement or something or additional time requirement. Um. Or actually, we don't have to say. We can just say decision. And then it'll just say the decision shall be made within 60 days from the date of the close of the public hearing. We had left this potentially open to um, revisiting. Uh, our town attorney indicated that he would delete it completely because he's always concerned with time requirements. Um, But but we included the phrase maybe extended. Yeah, we have the maybe extended and we changed it from 60 days from the filing to 60 days within the close of the public hearing, which gives you a lot more time than the 60 days of filing. So I think it's that's a good change. reasonable to think that the decision should be made 60 days from the time the hearing closes. <laughs> so okay, anything else for this? for the regulations. Seeing none for now, um, we will go on. To these. Um, you'll see some red here, uh, just clear. Uh, Conforming language in number one, it was for a parcel with up to. So I just made the language match. That's all. It but, didn't change. Yeah. We, didn't have, we, did, we didn't have the words parcel in number four and five. And five. And so now we do. Um, just I, I noticed that as I was reading it. So I threw it in here to make it a little quicker for people to see. Um, we have a decision to make on this one. Um, 
as noted in the note, we were unsure between number three or four and five for what to send off to the council. I will make it bigger, Jennifer. Thank you. I think that's what you were referencing. So thoughts on so, that? Yeah. Um, um, I, Pam and then Shalini. Okay, thanks. Sorry, sorry, I didn't do the official hand. Maybe Shalini should go first. So, um, I would, I would, I would like to um, encourage whoever establishes fees that number four, which is permits for up to up to nine, one to nine, on a on a parcel with up to nine dwelling units, that the the per additional unit be be modest, and I don't know if it's the same uh, additional per unit fee that number four ends up with in which case maybe it ends up getting merged into one category. Um, but, you know, the small the small apartment complexes around town are, are sort of in that range and they're not the big, they're not the big ones. They're not the Hobart Lane um, complexes that are, you know, more than 10 units lots more than 10 units. And it just felt to me that that one itself should be um, a, a very modest if if any if any additional unit fee per unit fee. Stani. Um this regarding whether it should be per unit or a st standard fee. That was one of the decisions, right? Yeah, one of the decisions is whether we keep after one and two, whether everyone, every parcel pays the same fee or whether we separate it out into potentially different fees based on the number of dwelling units. And then also whether we have a per unit over those two. So, right. so there's a couple of decisions, but okay. yes, so so, you, so with respect to that, I did look up Boston, Lynn and Burlington, Vermont. So at least two, cities in Massachusetts that are doing it per rental unit. And uh, again, I think I would emphasize that from an equity point of view, rather, you know, it's just the lens we're using to make this policy decision. If we are looking at it from the point of view of how much staff time is used, it's the same amount of staff time and we should charge the same amount. But if you're looking at it from the equity point of view of what is it costing the tenants and because we know that these fees are going to be passed on to the tenants. And so that means a single unit is being passed on $100. And in the other case, the $100 is divided by $5 or, you know, or even less over so many people. So what it's costing the tenants at the end of the day is not equitable when we charge the same thing. So I would really encourage us to have a per unit um, Other thoughts? So Jennifer, and then I will go. I really have a question. So when you say per unit, are we, we're still gonna have it, you know, in blocks? So if you have, so it's just, it'll still be, it'll still be broken out. It won't be that it's $20 a unit or is it if you have nine, each one's 20, if you have 400, each one's 20. Is that, I guess I'm asking Shalini if that's what she was. Yeah, I'm sorry, I was getting distracted. I was getting a note to put out my composting. So sorry, but yeah, I, th what I was saying was that it's not per parcel, but it's per unit on the parcel. So the extra would be per unit. And then in addition, if you want to, make it less for people like for less than six units or less than 10 units, it can, you know, it can be a really nominal additional fee or if you don't want to, but it's mainly for the bigger units that I think it's really make, it's not, uh, it's, it's better to make it per unit, not per parcel. Jennifer. Another question. I know we're leaving the actual amount to the finance committee, but would we want to leave part of this discussion for them as well? And so, so that was actually going to be my comment. I'm not sure which of these I want 
it sounds like people are 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 leaning towards four and five or number three that includes a plus that would include say number five um the the you can't really see it how the per unit above you know the plus a number per unit above one um up to a maximum of x per building and x per complex or something um without the differentiation between one and nine and ten i would say if we go with four and five or any of this additional numbers i would request that the what we transmit to the council and then to the finance committee is that the per unit should be nominal, like $5 or something, depending on what we're looking at um, and all. The other comment I have is, I guess this is a question for those that are sinking the one to nine and the 10 plus. When I had done the initial numbers, what I did with the base fee was say the one to nine would have a base fee of 100. And then if it's plus $5 a unit over one, then for a parcel with 10 or more, um, the base fee would be nine times five is 45 and 100, 145 or 150 plus something above it um, that includes that. And so I guess my question for the committee itself is, do you see sort of, you know, and if it's 150, if it's the exact number that 10, nine units would pay or 10 units would pay under four, that's the base fee on number five, do we need a split? Or are people foreseeing that, uh, for example, if number four, the base unit is, the base fee is 100 and the per unit fee over one is Five, you've got 145 when you get up to nine, or no, you get 140 when you get up to nine is the fee. Um, and so are you seeing then that the fee for a parcel of 10 or more might actually be 200 plus maybe even just $3 or something, or might it be, you know, are you seeing a different sort of in that fee at the 10 split as a base fee beyond if 10 units was charged under item four, such that we really need a split or that we don't need a split. Or are you seeing a change in the per unit costs at 10, you know, in, in the per unit number, is that the reason we would split it out? If the base fee doesn't change, would the per unit for one to nine be potentially $10, but the per unit for 10 or more be $5 or something like that? Is that, is that something people are thinking about? Or should we just move to number three and add all the options and then tell finance a good summary of this discussion. <laughs> yeah, I, if we gave them how much we need to recover to pay for our inspection for the staff and everything, give them the end number and then give them um, this discussion that I think it's a question of doing the the formula, you know, kind of an algebraic equation of this time X plus this, plus this many units by this should equal this and and giving them the criteria that we're trying to be most equitable to the tenants because if the finance committee is not familiar with the other conversations how the fees are passed on to tenants and uh how the, you know like we're trying to promote smaller which they probably know as a council all counselors know we're trying to promote workforce housing and make our housing affordable um but i think if you include all these different criteria for them and give them yeah they can do the formula part themselves. So the other thing, one of the things I would say we're referring it to finance is because, well, we have a high number, but we don't know, finance is in a better position to say, if this program is going to cost 500000 how much is going to be generated by fees and how much is going to be paid for under the current operating budget, how much of the mm -hmm. um, potentially how much of the strategic partnership agreement money will go towards this program, they have the ability to do that to then determine what that final number is they need to raise, right? We don't. <laughs> 
So I would include that as a as part of the report as to why we're sending it to them or requesting it be sent to them. Pam. Is there any documentation at all that the fees that have been um, raised this year because the fees doubled or more than doubled. Um, I don't believe that there has been any change in staff staffing within that department. And you know, before we before we talk about you know we must cover cost of this program, we don't we don't really know what the projection is for staff cost. And um, I want to make sure that that monies raised under this program actually help to perpetuate it and keep it as a sustainable program because we think it will benefit the town. Um, how do we how do we mandate, I guess is the word that I need to to, to use, that these funds are used for this purpose. Um, so we don't, we can only put it in a report. We have to trust Paul that he'll fund it appropriately, right? Um, but I think that's part of the reason we would send the fees off to the finance committee. I would send as part of that packet, um, as the report on all of this gets written for over a year and about a half of discussion, almost all the documents we've generated, the response that Rob Moore gave us a good response to questions about fees and what he expects the cost of the program to be and all of that. I would ship all of that off to the council or include in the report that goes then hopefully to finance along with the spreadsheets that we've created that gave some options and stuff um, just so they have as much information as they can and they don't repeat what we've done. Um, Jennifer, then Pam. Yeah, no, just Andy's been very clear that he wants it, that it's not revenue generating, it's to pay for the, it's to cover the costs and pay for the program. So. Pam. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot what I was going to say. So I want to bring us back to the highlighted sections because oh, I oh, don't yeah, think you should send this like this because it kind of conflicts. Yeah, Pam. I, I remember what I was going to say. It has to do with the uh, the spreadsheets, the tables that were, you know, if this many units at this price, da 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 da. I think before we send that off, can we please actually look at that array of costs and projections and whatever, um, and really clean it up? I mean, that was that was a very nice effort on your part to spell it out, um, but I think we before we just hand that off, it's it's way more complicated and so many different options that I think we have a little bit better idea now of how we might structure it. So yeah, I, I think if we decide to hand something off, I would make sure it's only got options for whatever this looks like, not everything we've been through and talking about other schedules, right? And so we would not include the the charts that had the inspection fee included in the residential rental permit fee, because that's not what we're recommending. So that we don't want to confuse them. So yeah, I could definitely clean it up to make sure it complies with whatever this fee schedule is in the end and has only those parts. Does that make sense? Yes. And I, I definitely want to take a look at it and, also. And we could, we in theory would have some time we could put looking at that on an agenda in the future um, once good. we have this um, to prep for sending that over. Thank you. And we, but we definitely send them the number of properties that are like with one unit with, you know, because they can be like, we have only two which are multiple and they decide to keep it at $3, but you're not really recouping. So they need that information. I, I don't intend to remove pages two or three from this document before we send it to the council mm -hmm. so that they will have that. Now, when it gets adopted by the council, in the end, when it comes back from finance, I would expect them to be removed because they get old quick. But for the purposes of our vote and transmitting to the council, I intend to keep them on this document. Pam. It's a good segue to the fact that we asked probably a year ago um, for more current numbers on estimated rental units in town. Um, we asked for um, 
you know, listings of of all of those properties that didn't appear to have the the tax bill being sent to the same location as the address of the property. And that was a very, very long time ago that we asked for that. I was hoping Rob was going to be here today to ask him that if we have, please, we really need that information prior to this conversation coming up for town council to discuss. And we, I, I will, I will send an email today asking for it again. Um, but I hope everybody supports that same request. We, we, we need that kind of information. This is only those units that that you know volunteered to do the program this past year, and we know that this is fewer than the ones that did it the first year around. So I think Rob answered that question a couple of meetings ago, but verbally. I don't think we've ever gotten it in writing. I, I do believe if we go back to minutes, he talked about how many they were going after that didn't match and everything, but I don't think we ever got a but written that have, report. That may have been that may have been, you know, the 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 low hanging or they've, you know, maybe they've gotten the low hanging fruit and that there were, you know, a handful left. I'd like to see the total number. I, I will ask him again um, because we have some other things to send. So I will ask him to put that information in writing. Thank you. Um, in it, preparation it, 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 includes, it includes total number of estimated dwelling units um, in, you know, one, two, three, four, how many ever units per, per parcel that, that they think we're missing. So I will ask him for an update from this October 2022 chart to give us one as of now, because um, it's almost a year old now. And then I will also ask him for his progress on finding those mismatches. And we okay. we want we want that number, whatever it is, whatever he's come up with so far, we need before town council discusses it. Whatever they've whatever they've assembled so far. Yeah, I, I will ask for it um, in my emails to Rob. So back to the highlighted. What are we going to include in this schedule? It sounds like, but I, I had questions, but it sounds like people are leaning towards these two. But I'm still not convinced people are leaning towards the breakdown versus just the fact that if you add a per unit you've covered it i'm i guess i'm not sure people are thinking that for one to nine the total number here when added up would be different than the 10 plus number respectively so that if you applied what would now be number three instead of to nine units to 20 units, that that would be a different number than if you applied whatever four is to 20 units. And I guess that's my question. Are people thinking that applying the rule in number three to 20 units would be a different fee than applying the rule in four to 20 units? Other than this maximum. can attempt to say something about this I, I again i think the goal is that for the smaller landowners that we keep the base fee low enough so that the basic would be so the base probably should be the same for all and it's the per unit that's changing that brings in more money for the town and it doesn't cost more to the tenants because it's being divided by over so many people. So yeah, so if you were charging hundred dollars for a single home, the you know, I don't think we can ever equate it because that hundred would be one person paying hundred, and then if you have two hundred people living, it's hundred plus two 
dollar let's say five dollars per unit so it's hundred you know that person but it's hundred divided by two hundred that's fifty cents so that person is still paying two and a half cents in the ten in the two hundred units so maybe hmm while you think Pam yeah. well <laughs> I, I keep going back and forth I I'm not sure um number our now number three which is the lower the lower end of the the dwelling units you know maybe maybe having the same base fee is the same base fee um i'm not trying to add cost to you know to dwelling units and so my intent is not to to add dollars just because there are more of them um but if if you know if we started across the board with, i mean my gut feeling and this is again based on anecdotal information from rob and, and john that in terms of inspections there are very few buildings in town residences in town that have mandated inspections so the inspection thing is in their mind what they're looking for um this is this is obviously just permitting we're still talking permitting fees excuse me um it, it seems to me that that the the former owner occupied or single family homes um although although we don't want to you know have the 25 the hundred dollar fee divided by the four you know folks living there 25 dollars a person right which seems more onerous than a five dollar per unit add-on in some other in some other complex um but we also understand that the single family dwellings have been some of the most problematic so we we're going to charge inspection fees separately for that so that will take care of right the right and i keep I, I think i keep blending those two categories yeah so i really do feel our basic fee should be lower because that everyone is going to have to pay and then we try to get so that from the tenant's point of view what they are paying us the base fee should be the lowest possible that we can and then we and it's and then add the five dollars per or whatever we decide um and that way the cost to the tenant is not going to be that much onerous but the town is receiving collecting maybe it's even a 50 dollar base what was it early it was 100 right i mean we don't have to go lower than that we can bring it down because we increase it and now if we bring it down to what it used to be which was 100 i think people should be happy with that well we're gonna let finance decide that but we're yeah. trying to figure out what type of structure we want to recommend to the council not the cost not the prices but the structure and that's where we're getting stuck in mm. so I it, guess what i'm he, pam it so it does sound that in fact then having a a, a basic base fee um may make sense for anything with multi multi-use um building multi multi-unit building the one starting with with um a non-owner occupied right so maybe we just we just keep it for all other par parcels right we bring all these things up to number three we have a base fee we have plus every unit over one up to a maximum of and so much per complex that probably makes sense so that as scary as some of the numbers are even though it's a per unit um add-on you know i can i can see those complexes with 400 units going 
oh my gosh, this is a $10,000 cost that we never budgeted for help. You know, it's way above a hundred dollars. And I'm just making it up, but. Yeah. There's also a possibility of saying up to a maximum of this much per parcel. Yeah. I've got a per building potential and a per parcel potential. Mm -hmm. um, right. So thinking differently, okay. some buildings have, you know, in mixed use buildings, the buildings are different, but leave that up to finance, up to finance. on which of those might be more logical. Does this in the residential rental fees look, is everyone good with this for now? Okay. That means I'm going to stop the share. We've seen everything. We've gone through it. I have some potential motions. Um, so I'm going to read them one at a time. And I can go through them fast and we can talk about them as we get there. Um, but I believe Kelly has them. So, um, <laughs> So I think Kelly can get it. Actually, before we do the motions, um, I, I want to actually, before we actually do the motions, we're going to pause the motions. We're going to pause this discussion and go to public comment before we finally do the motions. Um, so right now I'm going to open public comment on matters within jurisdiction of the CRC. You're welcome to express your views for up to three minutes. Um, if you'd like to make a public comment, please raise your hand. We have one person that would like to. So um Hilda Greenbaum, please un unmute yourself. And yeah. make I, am I on? Yes, you are. Okay. I wanted to speak last week, but I had to run off to zoning board and I never got called on. Um, first of all, my experience first as an assessor and also uh, my, my eight years on the zoning board, I've been in a lot of units. And I want to tell you that you're going to find the worst public health and safety standards in the single family homes where you don't even know that they're renting out a cellar with no egress or an attic with no egress. And you're not going to find them. And those are serious problems and where the deaths occur. Well, we have had over the years a couple in people in attic apartments without egress that have died in a fire. And so I, that, that's one point I wanna make that just don't assume and stereotype a single family home that's owner occupied is gonna be pristine castle for, for these tenants to live in. It's not true. And I know this cause I've been in them where the oven door and the, and the um, refrigerator door are held together by duct tape because they applied for a, uh, um, an abatement on their taxes. It was too high, so I got to see the house and the steps were rotten. And it's been a house that to me has been a problem for 40 years, but finally I think it got sold, so something may happen to it. But um, the other comment I make is the per unit is grossly unfair. I own buildings, now I own four. One is a single family home attached to a unit at 351 Main Street. It has one very small two bedroom and six studio one bedroom type, two room, one bed, whatever you want to call it, a studio or a one bedroom. It's two rooms, a living room and a bedroom with a kitchen in, in the living room. Um, so there's eight beds there. If it were a three family, I wouldn't have to pay the bid fee, which is equal to 0.01% um, of my, my uh, assessed value, which is something over $500 a year, for which I get, my benefit happens to be, I get a urn of flowers from the bid at the bus stop there, but they don't even shovel out the bus stop. So that's 500 bucks those kids have to pay through their, their rent. So that's eight bedrooms. You're charging me the same thing as a two family house would pay that's full of, um, 14, 15 year old, well, acting 14 or 15 year old, column 16 and 17 year old, freshmen and sophomores living in a house that's a problematic. You're charging me the same fee you're charging them because that's grossly unfair. Knickerbocker has 20 units. We have owned that building for more than 45 years. It has never 
had a complaint. My units have never had a complaint. And I, and I don't really think that the per unit fee is fair because a 200 square foot studio does not have the problems that a 3,600 square foot two family house has. And, and therefore I think either you need to look at number of bedrooms or look at the number of square feet and try to come up with something that's more reasonable. I think Shalini has her finger on it, but, but I think that you need to think in terms of why should a postdoc in biochemistry who's in the lab all day long have to, have to suffer the same thing as a bunch of kids that party 24 hours a day? Um, it, it's just not fair. And, and so the per student fee, the per room fee for the rent is probably about the same. It's, at this point, I have to pay all the utilities. My tenants don't have to pay that. Um, but I think that you, you got to think another way than per unit, because as I say, a four bedroom house has many more problems than a, than a 150, 200 square foot studio, which basically has a shower, a sink, and a little 20 inch stove in it. What's going to go wrong? Because the heating, the plumbing and all that is not within that unit. It's aside from it. So, um, please where, finish. You know, I mean, it should, you've got to think fair and you've got to think of, you know, where are the problems? It's not with my units. Thank you, Hilda, for your comments. People don't, people don't even know what the Knickerbocker is there. Down at 85 North Whitney Street. They don't even know what's there. It, time, it's so, time is it's up, so, I mean, just for an example, those are the two things that are on the top of my head. They have been for a few weeks and bother me. Make it fair. Otherwise, you're going to find yourself in trouble. Thank you for your comments, Hilda. Uh, with that, there are no more public comments, so we will go back to um, proposed motions. Um, the first one is move. Uh, I'm going to move to recommend the town council rescind general bylaw 3.50 residential rental property and replace it with general bylaw 3.50 residential rental property, as shown on the document titled three general bylaw 3.50 residential rental property CRC working draft revision 17 2023 07 as modified at CRC on July 20th 2023 with effective date of April 1, 2024. So that is the proposed motion. Um, we can talk about the effective date um, before I formally make that motion if there are questions on that. Pam. Uh, we had a couple un unanswered questions and um, I don't want to commit to anything until we sort of resolve those questions. Do other people feel the same that we should not vote today and bring it back next time for or, a final or, vote? Or, the, or the, the, the other alternate way of thinking about that is how do we cover the fact that we have a couple of updates or changes that need to be, re, need to be included and aren't in this version? I mean, I, I would personally feel better if it were wrapped up in a bow rather than having some loose ends, but if others want to move it along with the caveat that we fix it later, I don't know how to do that. Thoughts? Jennifer. Are we meeting again before it goes to the council so we could? So it can't go to the council until we vote, but- um, right, but if we vote, will we next, get to look at those loose ends before? The, the next council meeting is August 7th. And so, um, we have a meeting scheduled for August 3rd. We could put it on that meeting to be able to look at the loose ends and potentially make any final changes if necessary. Um, it might be nice to have votes now so that we can tell Lynn that, um, and then I could get a date she might schedule it, right? Right now, until we're voting, it's hard to know when she might put it on an agenda, whether it would be August 7th or whether, whether it would be later. Um, but if I tell her we voted, we would always have the chance I could re-put it on the August 3rd agenda here, but we could put most of the packet together if she decides to put it on the 7th. Pam. I'm just thinking that it would require a, a fairly extensive report. Um, that seems really awkward if you if we have if we have dangling loose ends 
and somehow those have to be covered in a report and and town council needs some time to read it because it's very complicated so i yes. feel like i feel like something should go in town council packet at least two weeks before the meeting occurs i mean so i can't write a report to submit to the council until there's a vote um, I can always write updated reports. I think it's one of the reasons I'm pushing for a vote so that I can start the report. <laughs> and then we can always do updated or supplemental reports if we continue. But I don't think Lynn will put this on an agenda until we've actually voted. Um, and so I, I would recommend we vote at least one of these now um, so that I can get these on. So I can get to Lynn and say we need these scheduled for an agenda and that we can then figure that out. We have at least one more meeting in CRC before we go to the, before it could possibly go to the council. I don't know whether she would put it on that meeting or not. Um, but I, I I need to, I can't write, and I cannot submit a report till there's been a vote. So if Lynn would wanna put this on the August 7th meeting, I couldn't even submit a report till August 8th at the earliest, uh, August 4th at the earliest, which I, I agree is too late for an August 7th meeting. Um, whereas if we voted now, I could submit one next week for publication in the packet, even if that report says will be supplemented on August 4th. <laughs> you know, with big, bold things, but I could at least start it with a preliminary vote. Jennifer. Well, it, at the last council meeting, Lynn said, I, I think she said that the proposed zoning revisions and the street light were going to be on August 7th. So I don't see how this could, seems like that's just too many really big. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know what she would do. Um, but I, I don't think she'll think of any scheduling until we've actually voted. I'm going to ask then how how would you propose covering the uh, and I'll and I'll be really honest to have a you know how many ever pages we have to read with any kind of commentary with a couple of loose ends and then expect people to a read a report and read any updates that will freak people out it freaks me out when I'm even when I'm reading the wrong version of something and I've looked through it carefully and oh oh I actually wasn't reading the most current version it's it's not fair to people to load them up with multiple you know reading materials I'm sorry it's just really this is a big deal Shalini you're muted Shalini is there a, uh, you know, the timeline, Mandy Joe? like given that we want to give finance committee time to do their thing and everything, like what is, what do you see? Like if it goes to the next, gets bumped to the next council meeting, would that throw everything off or? So I don't know what Lynn would do, but I doubt she would put it on the second August council meeting, given what all's already on that one. There might be a possibility that she'd add it to the first count August meeting and the August 7th meeting if we voted today. Otherwise, this would not get heard at minimum until September. It probably needs a referral to GOL after that council meeting is heard for clear, consistent, and actionability because that bylaws require that. Then it needs two readings after that because I don't expect that this, this version would get posted on the bulletin board for the 14 days for voting or that our recommendation would be the first reading, although I don't know whether Lynn would consider it a first reading or not, but it needs two readings after that. If we don't get it into the council in September, we're looking at adopting it in November. That would also be about the time. I don't know when the council would decide to refer a fee schedule, probably not until adoption. Um, the fee schedule would need to be in place well before any bylaw becomes actually effective. Um, so the longer we wait, the less likely it is that a fee schedule gets adopted before the end of the year. Can we vote on just the fee structure that asking or recommending to town council to send this fee structure to finance committee before and and meanwhile we can close all the uh, we can fees. i'm just not sure that they will know what to do with it until they've got a bylaw in hand 
Hmm. Pam. I was wondering if uh, we could modify your motion and we could take a straw vote to express general agreement or disagreement with this bylaw as we currently have it pending a resolution of a couple loose ends, which in my mind weren't, they weren't big deals. Mm -hmm. They're just, you know, questions that are left hanging. And I don't know how people feel about going that route to give, to give somebody the, at least the go ahead to start working on a report. Yeah. So I would do that by at the end of that motion that said, as rec, you know, in the document titled blah, 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 as modified on July 20th, 2023, comma, pending resolution of final questions. Mm -hmm. And then we'll revote when we resolve those and we'll just have a new recommendation. Mm -hmm. Does that work? Yeah. So that's the motion. I'll read it quickly again. Um, it's moved, and, and I'm just going to read it quickly without all of the full length of things. So it's moved to recommend the town council rescind general bylaw 3.50 and replace it with general bylaw 3.50 as shown in the document titled general bylaw as modified at CRC on July 20th, 2023, pending resolution of final questions with effective date of April 1, 2024. Second. <laughs> Any further discussion on that? Jennifer. You know, this is a dumb question, but this does not include the fee structure. We're just voting on the- We're doing three different motions. Three, three different, okay. This one's the bylaw. Okay. Uh, we'll start the vote, Shalini. Yes. Pat. Aye. Mandy's an aye, Pam. Yes. Yeah. Jennifer. Yes. That is unanimous. The next motion is, um, uh, I'll just say Kelly. Well, Kelly's no longer here. Um, it's going to add that same phrase. Move to recommend in accordance with general bylaw 3.50 residential rental property. Um, the town council adopt regulations for general bylaw 3.50 residential rental property as shown on the document titled Three regulations for gen general bylaw 3.50 residential rental property CRC working draft re revision 9 2023 as modified at CRC on July 20, 2023, pending resolution of final questions with effective date of April 1, 2024. Is there a second? Second. Rooney. Thank you. Any further discussion? This is the regulations. Seeing none, Pat. Aye. Uh, Pam. Yes. Sorry, I forgot me. I'm an I. Jennifer. Yes. And Shalini. Shalini? Yes. <laughs> that one is also unanimous. Final one, moved to recommend the town council refer to the finance committee the document titled three residential, oh, sorry, three rental registration fee schedule proposed revision 5 2023 714 as modified at CRC for a recommendation on the fees to charge under general bylaw 3.50 residential rental property with a report to town council by November 30, 2023. Does that one need the pending resolution of questions too? I think we need more discussion on it. Do you want, do this we- want me, I don't, Rather than trying to vote it down, I just- Okay. I, so I will withdraw that motion and we will put that one on the agenda for next week. Because we really didn't talk about inspection fees either, so it, it's... Okay. Seeing that, um, we are done action items. We are not doing any discussion items. The minutes were not in the packet. I don't have announcements. Next agenda we've talked about, but it will also have um, a brief of... So it will have some of this on it, and it will have the uh, intro to specialized. Jennifer. I did see minutes in the packet. We don't have to they do were them the now. June twenty second minutes that we passed last week. Right. Yeah. Okay, that's funny because I thought the word entirety had been left off of last week's, and it okay. We're yeah. No, they were, packets, but but they were in both packets as the same. Right. So I read they them, were adopted I last week. So I read so, them twice. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, I don't have anticipated items, so with that, I'm adjourning the meeting at six forty p.m. Thank you. Bye. Bye all. Back to splitting wood.
Nope.